Hi everyone. Um, so this is I'm Unique Just Like You, Human Side Channels and the Implications for Security and Privacy. My name is Matt Wixey. I, I lead security research for PwC UK cybersecurity practice. Um, I'm also a part-time PhD student at University College London, but not on this particular subject. Uh, I've worked at PwC for about three years now. Prior to that, I worked in the Met Police in London um, doing research and development. And I've previously spoken at a number of other security conferences, including BUCON uh, a couple of years ago as well. On that subject, uh, just a quick disclaimer, or more of a warning than anything else, I guess. So um, does anyone remember my BUCON talk from a couple of years ago? I talked about drones and lasers and bypassing motion detectors. It was all really cool. And um, last year, someone came up to me and said, uh, this guy called Carl Miller has put a thing about you in his book, in his latest book. So I bought an e-book copy and saw this. Uh, this was the footnote. And uh, this is what he actually said. Uh, and there's a particular phrase in here that, that will serve as this kind of warning or disclaimer, which is that. So if I see you falling asleep or walking out, I won't judge you. I won't take it personally. Um, so the aims for this talk, um, I'm going to cover three human side channels, and I'll explain what they are shortly um, and how they work. I'm going to give you some practical takeaways for each one. Uh, including some tools that you can play with straight away. Um, I'll look at the implications of those side channels for security and privacy, uh, some possible countermeasures on the privacy perspective, and then some ideas for future research as well. Uh, so these are the three human side channels we're going to cover. Uh, forensic linguistics, behavioral signatures, and something called cultural captures, which is more of a new concept. Um, before we get started, I want to tell you a story. Does anyone know who John Christie is? Familiar with him? Oh, not too many. Okay, that's interesting. So um, the story behind this is in 1949, uh, a man called Timothy Evans walked into a police station and he told the police that he had accidentally killed his wife. He gave four statements to the police, um, lots of uh, details of which contained contradictory information, but he was tried at court, he was found guilty, and he was executed. It subsequently turned out that this man, John Christie, who had shared a house with Timothy Evans, uh, was actually guilty for that murder and for the murder of about seven other people, uh, at least seven other people. And where kind of this talk fits into that story is around forensic linguistics. So uh, a researcher, uh, a linguistics professor called Jan Svartvik, studied uh, the statements that Timothy Evans had given to the police. And these statements were supposed to be verbatim transcripts of what had been said. But what Svartvik actually found was that there were a number of distinct authorial voices in those statements. One was Timothy Evans, but the others were believed to be of the police officers who had interviewed him. In other words, the police officers had manipulated those statements to make Evans appear guilty. And as a result, Timothy Evans was posthumously pardoned after he'd been executed for that murder. So, the background of this talk, if we're looking for an offender or a criminal or a suspect, uh, and it's a real world crime, it's a burglary or a murder or something like that, there are a number of things we can look at evidentially. We look at things like fingerprints and DNA. We might even look at things like gait analysis, so how someone walks on camera or something like that. When it comes to digital offences, there are sort of uh, analogies to that in the form of IP addresses and MAC addresses and domain names, that kind of thing, uh, what you might call kind of discrete identifiers. The problem with those, of course, is they're really easy to obfuscate and anonymize and spoof. So as a result, um, investigators will often look at other techniques to try and attribute offences to individuals uh, or to threat actors. So uh, a common one is that... Um, investigators may try to correlate attack activity to uh, time zones of a particular region so that they can say the threat actor group is most probably located in this uh, time zone. Uh, other investigators will look at TTPs, so look at the techniques and tactics and, and uh, tools that are used by offenders. The problem with these is they take us further away from the individual. They might bring us to a threat actor group or to a region of the world, um, but not to fingers on keyboards, which is what this talk is going to be about. So when we look at um, computers, machines, they have side channels. They have uh, unintentional leakage, usually in some primitive output like sound or light, um, as a result of the things that they do. 
Um, and that can, uh, in many cases, be used for things like tracking. So radio signals, for example, uh, something called radio fingerprinting can be used to track um, chips with a very high degree of accuracy. And there is potentially a real world equivalent to this. If you consider humans as kind of biocomputers, we have our own outputs, we have speech and text and that sort of thing. And we may also have unintentional leakage as a result of generating those outputs, which in theory can be used to trace or track certain activities to us. And this is rooted in something called personality psychology theory, um, which essentially says that because we all have a unique upbringing and training and um, experiences and ways of looking at the world, that we have distinctive yet consistent behavioral signatures with everything we do in the way that we react to things, in the way that we write, in the way that we talk, in the way that we type on a computer. And this is what I mean by the term human side channels. So I'm going to start with forensic linguistics. So um, the reason I'm interested in forensic linguistics, my first degree was in uh, English literature and language. This is from a genuine email chain, my first year at university. Uh, I emailed my professor and told him I wanted to do an essay on the etymology of the F word. Uh, and this was his response. Um, genuinely, that was his response. Um, so anyway, that, that kind of degree got me interested in, uh, in linguistics and looking at language. So, um, is anyone familiar with forensic linguistics? Have we got any linguists in the room at all? No? Anyone heard of the term before? Yeah? A handful of people? Okay, all right, cool. If you haven't heard of forensic linguistics, it's a, it's a pretty niche discipline. Um, so, it was started by that professor I mentioned uh, earlier on, Jan Svartvik. Um, and essentially, it's the theory that everyone has a unique style of writing or a distinctive style of writing. Um, not so much in, uh, it's not handwriting or anything like that. I'll come to what it isn't uh, shortly. But it's the way that you construct uh, writing in terms of sentences and paragraphs and vocabulary and things like that. There are various different branches of forensic linguistics, uh, but the one we're going to look at is something called stylometry, which is authorship attribution. So given a piece of text, can I infer who wrote it? And it normally looks at these five things, spelling and orthography, grammar, lexicon, vocabulary, uh, idiom, and identical expressions. And in the real world, forensic linguistics is used in a number of, uh, of scenarios. It's used in law enforcement investigations um, prominently, um, particularly for things like ransom notes or for text messages that have been sent after murders or related to murders, that sort of thing. Uh, it's used in academia to try and investigate um, plagiarism allegations. It's been used in literature um, to try and work out if Shakespeare actually wrote Shakespeare's plays or if it was uh, someone else. Um, and similarly with the Federalist Papers, um, with J.K. Rowling's first post Harry Potter novel, uh, which was written under a pseudonym, uh, Forensic Linguistics was used to show that it was her, um, and uncovering miscarriages of justice, as with the Timothy Evans, John Christie case as well. What Forensic Linguistics isn't is working out if someone's telling the truth or not. Um, that's a separate discipline, um, and a really interesting paper on this is the one by Van der Zee and others uh, last year. Um, they took the tweets of a well-known uh, world leader, um, and they were able to, um, using a machine learning model and certain kind of linguistic uh, signposts when you lie, they were able to work out um, the probability of each tweet being true or not. Uh, forensic linguistics isn't trying to work out what someone means by a piece of text, it's not an interpretation of it. It's not um, as kind of granular or precise as a fingerprint, um, so that's kind of a um, you know, a misconception sometimes. As I said, it's not analyzing handwriting or anything like that. And it's not looking normally at the context or the content of text. It's purely around the structure um, and the kind of technical elements of writing. So how do you do it? Um, there are various ways. Uh, complex uh, methodologies involve the creation of a corpus, essentially a database of texts. Um, from that database, you extract certain features that you're interested in, and they can be things like uh, word length, sentence length, number of pronouns, that kind of thing. And then you do some form of statistical comparison. Um, nowadays, one of the, the ones that's most often used is support vector machines in machine learning, um, but there are kind of traditional statistics that are used as well, so principal component analysis, that kind of thing. A more basic usage of it, um, and I'm going to go into a bit more detail on this later, 
is just looking for unusual spellings and punctuation and sentence structure. And that's something that doesn't necessarily require any kind of machine learning or anything like that. Um, and then just searching for those same things either on just Google or, or within a corpus that you've built. So here are a couple of examples of, of where that basic um, technique has been used uh, in the real world. Uh, the woman on the left is called Julie Turner. Uh, she was murdered in the UK in 2005. Um, and after she went missing, uh, texts were sent from her phone uh, to someone else's phone saying that she was leaving and going away to sort her head out. One of the suspects uh, in that murder case, when interviewed by police, uh, used exactly the same term. Uh, when he was speaking to the officers um, and it was later found out that he was the one who had committed the murder and who had sent those texts from Julie Turner's phone pretending to be her. On the right are two Scottish men uh, who were um, sent to prison in the 80s during a gang war in Scotland for, um, for murder. The interesting thing here is this is about um, kind of recollection and memory as much as linguistics. So these two men were alleged by the police to have said a particular phrase um, some hours after they were alleged to have said it. And a number of police officers were able to apparently recall the exact phrase um, that had been said. Um, and research shows that really that's kind of not possible. People would have kind of different memories, that kind of thing. But again, a basic um, technique because an investigator into this Googled that phrase and was not able to kind of find any other appearances of it. So the suspicion was that the police officers had made that up. In terms of um, cybercrime, cybersecurity specifically, uh, there's been a lot of academic research on how to apply forensic linguistics to various scenarios. Uh, looking at tweets, looking at things like detecting sock puppet accounts. So if one person, for instance, is running multiple uh, social media accounts, pretending to be different people, you could use forensic linguistics to try and tie those back to one individual. Uh, similarly, with forum posts that have been um, written under kind of anonymous names or pseudonyms, uh, same with emails. There's also a really interesting sub-discipline of this, uh, which is looking at source code. Um, so using stylometry to try and attribute source code to an individual, because everyone has their own kind of unique style of writing source code. And that has been expanded recently by Kaliskan Islam and others, um, where they've been able to de-anonymize uh, programmers based on compiled binaries, um, so after uh, compilation, because some of those artifacts still survive, which is uh, really interesting. Some case studies. Um, in the real world applied to cyber. Operation Tripoli, which was a checkpoint investigation um, just a few months ago. This was a uh, mass scale Facebook social engineering campaign uh, where fake profiles were set up as kind of watering holes um, and people visiting those profiles, those pages and clicking on links were subjected to drive-by malware attacks. Um, what Checkpoint were able to do, which is really cool, is they were looking for repeated spelling errors um, and grammatical errors made by the authors of those fake profiles. And by doing so, they're able to reveal uh, over 30 other profiles which were by the same threat actor. Judith Tebron in 2016 uh, looked at the language used by IRS phone scammers, um, so people who try and um, do social engineering over the phone to con people out of money, and was able to find a number of techniques that those individuals used um, which could help people identify them as scammers before, um, before the crime actually occurs. And then lastly, there's Guccifer 2.0. Um, this is a fascinating example. So in this case, you had uh, a suspect who was from one country pretending to be a native speaker of another country, um, which was really interesting. So that's definitely worth a look, the work by uh, Argamon uh, a couple of years ago. Some other use cases that you could apply forensic linguistics to would be uh, spear phishing, um, so where you've got threat actors sending emails perhaps under different pretexts, but pretend, um, but they are by the same author. Um, things like manifestos that are posted online after or before attacks, uh, ransomware instructions, um, potentially insider threats, so kind of language profiling. Um, tweets that coordinate things like DDoS attacks, um, and then you could, uh, if you wanted to, if you were interested, I suppose you could try and use it to identify people like Satoshi Nakamoto. Um, I'd be surprised if that hasn't been done already, if someone hasn't tried that, but, um, but potentially you could do it. So an example of how you could use this would be, say, a spear phishing email comes into your organization or you're working for an incident response team looking at a spear phishing email that's come in. You might notice an unusual turn of phrase or several kind of unusual sentences. You could Google that. That might then give you further leads to go on and investigate. Similarly, if you've got, um, if you've become aware of certain attacks like DDoS attacks being coordinated on Twitter, you could 
take certain phrases or words from those tweets and then compare them either to a corpus that you have or again search on Google to try and get some, some new leads. Now the, um, the problem that a lot of people kind of suggest when I say this is but isn't forensic linguistics a really kind of specialist discipline? Don't you need a, at least a master's degree uh, in linguistics to be able to do it? Don't I need to know machine learning and have kind of expensive stats software and things like that? And you don't really. It's really simple. So I'm going to show you some tools that you can use uh, that are all open source. They're all free to download um, that you can kind of play around with. Um, so this is the first one. This is JGAP. Um, this is fairly well maintained, uh, a fairly steep learning curve um, because it uses a lot of different techniques and you have to play around with a lot of the settings. Um, but it's, it's uh, a good introduction to it. Um, it works pretty well. There's a delta spreadsheets. Um, so this only uses kind of one statistical measure. Um, and as security professionals, you'll, you'll be delighted to know that for this one, you have to download a spreadsheet and enable macros. Um, but um, as you can see, the, the kind of output of this doesn't look that user friendly at first. Once you get used to it, it's not that bad. It's a fairly simple, um, fairly simple process. The stylometry, which is a um, couple of Python scripts, this one gives you a nice graphical output. So um, the output of this one is on the right-hand side. It's a graph. This is using a technique called principal components analysis. And what it does is it groups text according to how similar they are. Um, so you can see here there are various examples of well-known um, novels and plays in English literature. And they've been grouped together according to how similar um, this algorithm determines that they are. And you can see how that could be applied to a corpus of spear phishing emails or, or tweets or something like that. Uh, Stylo is a library for the stats package R, open source. Um, so this is a nice one. Again, a number of different techniques you can use. It's got a nice GUI. I think you need to know about kind of five uh, instructions to be able to run everything in it, um, which is quite nice. And then Shiloh, which is my favorite, is a, a graphical wrapper for Stylo. Um, so this can be run in a browser. Um, and as you can see, again, you've got the output on the right-hand side here of where it's group text according to how similar they are. Uh, again, you can kind of play with the configuration and stuff with this as well. So um, this is an example of me using Shiloh for some blog articles um, within PwC. Um, so you can see mine at the top there, Wixie, uh, and then you've got some by my colleagues, uh, James Hampshire and Rob McGregor. And you can see that um, the algorithm's done a pretty good job of kind of grouping those together according to how similar they are. Um, there are some caveats to that which I'll come back to, but um, if you're interested, this is a table of all the tools, um, how hard I think they are to use, uh, what methods they use, um, and how scalable they might be um, depending on kind of how, how much you wanted to use this. So caveat, so um, something called register makes a very big difference with forensic linguistics. Register is the style in which you're writing, the audience which you're writing for. Um, you do need a baseline of text, um, so you do need kind of some sizable samples of text. You can't just compare kind of one tweet to one other tweet. Um, you may need some ground truth, depending on what you're trying to prove. Um, if there's a significant time lapse between two pieces of writing, that can affect the results. So if someone's written something and then 10 years they've written, 10 years later they've written something else, um, it may appear very different. And it's not a silver bullet. It's not guaranteed to be 100% accurate. So um, here are a couple of examples of how register can make a big difference, just to illustrate. So uh, the graph on the left um, contains various chapters from the novel 1984 by George Orwell. Um, has anyone read 1984? Yeah, oh, quite a few. Okay, awesome. So um, in 1984, there's a chapter, uh, you'll remember, which is uh, kind of a book within a book. It's the book that was written by uh, Goldstein that Winston Smith is reading. Um, and that is that outlier here down towards the bottom, the bottom left, is that book within a book. Um, because Orwell wrote that particular chapter in a different style, pretending to be a different author. So it shows you how well that can kind of um, distort register. Uh, on the right, you've got my blog articles, and then you've got like various short stories and things that I've written. So even though it's the same person writing all these things, because I've written them in a different genre, different style, whilst my blog articles are all in kind of corporate speak, so you can group them quite closely together, everything else is all over the place. Now, there are some privacy uh, implications with forensic linguistics, obviously. Um, 
there are really legitimate and powerful reasons why people would want to write anonymously uh, or under a different identity. And potentially, forensic linguistics could be used to diminish that anonymity. Um, there are some countermeasures available. Um, even just being aware that you have a distinct linguistic style can help you to kind of overcome um, being tracked by it and help you to disguise it. You could try imitating someone else's style. That's something that's been uh, looked at um, before. Something that gets suggested quite a lot is using Google Translate. So running uh, a particular phrase through Google Translate and then translating it like 12 times into 12 different languages and then converting the end result back into whatever language it is you want to, to use. Um, you then kind of have to it really messes up the meaning, so you kind of have to, you know, uh, massage it a little bit. But um, but that can work. You can combine uh, with other authors. That can help. It can be quite difficult to kind of differentiate um, between different authors. There are specific tools as well um, that have been developed to try and um, uh, defeat forensic linguistics, one of which is Anonymouth, um, which was published in 2012. You can still get hold of that on GitHub. Uh, it's not been maintained, and you kind of have to mess around with the code to get it to work. Um, but it, it's an area, I think, that's kind of crying out for some more work uh, in terms of countermeasures and uh, enabling privacy. So what can you do now with forensic linguistics if you wanted to take this back um, to wherever it is you work and, and your day job? You could um, just build up uh, your corpus, a kind of database of text, um, whether that's from previous attacks, whether it's open source stuff, just have a play with those tools and see if they work and see if it's something that you, you might want to, um, to use if you could use it. Okay, um, we'll move on to the next human side channel which is behavioral signatures. I always pause there for a laugh, but it never gets one, because it's a very, very niche audience of um, machine learning engineers and Jay-Z fans, um, which uh, <laughs> I don't think maybe doesn't exist. Um, so uh, this is about attribution specifically based on behavior. Um, so aside from things like discrete identifiers that we mentioned previously, IP addresses, MAC addresses, that sort of thing. An active area of research in kind of attribution is who hacks and, and why do they hack. So it's a kind of sociographic, ethnographic uh, look at it. And there have been various authors who have looked at things like uh, motivation and skill and attack behaviors. There's the hacker profiling project you might be aware of. Um, there's looking at the psychological elements of being involved in uh, the hacker culture. Um, and specifically what attackers do on a compromised machine. What hasn't been looked at is trying to compare those profiles and those things. Um, and that led me onto something called case linkage analysis. Is anyone familiar with case linkage analysis or sort of it before? It's a pretty niche discipline um, and it's primarily been used in academia. Um, it's essentially a way to statistically try and link crimes together based on very granular common features. It's not offender profiling. Um, offender profiling uh, is trying to infer something about an offender based on a crime. Uh, case linkage analysis is looking at particular features of a crime and comparing it to another crime to see how similar they might be. And in doing so, potentially you can link it to a common offender. Um, so there has, been, uh, there has been some success in academic literature with applying case linkage analysis to real world crimes in homicide, burglary, robbery, uh, sexual offenses, arson, that kind of thing. Uh, but not cyber attacks uh, until the research I'm going to present to you now. Um, but case linkage analysis is based on those same principles I mentioned earlier of distinctiveness and consistency. This idea that um, offenders, like anyone else, have distinctive yet consistent ways of offending. Um, so if you take one crime that they've committed, it's highly likely that they will behave in a similar way in their next offence. And uh, the benefits of linking um, are that you can investigate crimes together, so you can save on resources, you can build up a body of evidence, um, you can um, use it as a decision-making aid, various kind of other benefits as well. So let's look at a, a couple of examples. This is a, a really simple example, but let's say uh, you're a police officer and you're investigating this crime, uh, which in the UK would be uh, criminal damage. Um, and then you've got a second crime not too far away. And you think that these crimes might be linked, but how do you prove it? How do you kind of get a statistical um, evidence base for saying that these two crimes were probably committed by the same person? 
So case linkage analysis requires that, first of all, you create something called behavioral domains, which is essentially kind of categories of behavior. So in this case, you might be looking at equipment used or property targeted, that kind of thing. Then within each of those categories, each of those domains, you're going to have very granular behaviors, which are essentially yes, no questions. So um, with these examples, did the attacker use a stencil? Um, did they use color or was it in black and white? Did they sign the image? Did they use this kind of paint or that kind of paint? And so on and so on. And you repeat that for every behavioral domain that you've got. You then calculate something called a similarity coefficient. Um, now, this is a pretty crude measure of the similarity between two things. Has anyone done anything with similarity coefficients before? No, okay, this is probably uh, one of the simplest ones. Um, this is the one that's normally used in case linkage analysis. So for each behavioral domain that you've got, you have uh, an X value, which is behaviors present in both attacks, a Y value, which is behaviors present in crime A, but not crime B, a Z value, which is the opposite of that. And that will give you a value between one, which is perfect similarity, so the crimes are identical, and zero, which means they're perfectly dissimilar. You could stop there if you wanted to, if you're not kind of interested in getting into the kind of statistical depth, you could use this as a very crude measure. Um, if you wanted to take it further, there's logistic regression. Um, so logistic regression is a, a statistical technique that will let us try and predict whether or not crimes were committed by the same offender, uh, using that similarity coefficient as a starting point. It will also tell us which of those behavioral domains contributes more to predictive accuracy. And um, if we combine them, what's the best way of combining them to try and work out the answer? Now, if you haven't um, played with logistic regression before, um, but you want to kind of play around with it and, and see if you can replicate or test out these results, um, there's loads of tutorials online. It's not difficult. I'd never done any logistic regression uh, before I did these experiments, so there's hope for everyone. Um, and you can use something called SPSS, which is a, a tool um, that you can, uh, I think that's a paid tool, but there's also R, which is a free one that you can use as well. So you would run logistic regression for each behavioral domain, and that would give you a positive or negative correlation, uh, something called a p-value, which just uh, gives you an indication of statistical significance. Um, and you could also use something called forward stepwise logistic regression, which essentially is, is machine learning. Um, so you would start with one behavioral domain, and you'd add one at each step and work out the extent to which that contributes towards the predictive accuracy of the entire model. You then use something called rock curves. Has anyone heard of rock curves before or done played around with rock curves? Okay, uh, so rock curves, um, the rock stands for receiver operating characteristic, and it's just a graphical way to represent the predictive accuracy of machine learning, essentially. So it's a graph, it plots um, X, which is the probability of a false positive, against Y, which is the probability of a true positive. Um, and the value that we're interested in is something called an AUC value, which automatically gets calculated um, when you create a rock curve. Um, this is what a rock curve looks like. Um, so the area that we're interested in is the AUC value, uh, area under the curve. Um, and if that AUC value is 0.5 to 0.7, that means it's low predictive accuracy. 0.7 to 0.9 means good, and 0.9 to 1 is high, perfect. So why would you want to apply case linkage analysis to cyber attacks? Um, and why hadn't it been done before? Why did I decide to do it? Well, um, in principle, uh, a cyber offense is the same as any other offense. You have an offender attacking a target, um, there's a victim, the offender has to have a certain offending strategy in order to obtain the result that they want. Um, and the idea for this actually came when I was doing uh, OSCP uh, a few years ago now. Um, have we got any OSCPs in the room? Oh, well, okay, quite a few, awesome. So um, you remember um, when you do OSCP that you get access to like uh, an IRC channel and you get to talk to other students who are also doing this and you're all talking about machines in the lab that you're attacking um, and you're kind of swapping strategies and tools and ideas and that kind of thing. And what I noticed in this IRC channel was that um, firstly that people have a seem to have a different way of doing things. Uh, everyone's got their own kind of pet strategy for attacking a certain vulnerability or something like that. And the second thing was once someone had kind of settled on a particular way of doing things, they tended to stick to that way of doing things. So again, it's distinctiveness and consistency. 
So a scenario where you might kind of want to use this is, let's say you've got uh, a network breach, any type of network breach really, um, and then a couple of years later there's another one. And it seems like the methodology is really similar. It might be the same kind of malware, it might be uh, a similar vulnerability that was exploited or they're exfiltrating similar types of data. And going back to the graffiti example, what we would want to do is work out what's the statistical probability that this is done by the same offender. So, uh, onto the interesting part, which is the experiment that I ran to try and um, uh, empirically show that case linkage analysis can be used for investigating cyber offences. So, I took a, uh, an open source SSH keylogger um, from GitHub, modified it a little bit, and I set up two virtual machines and exposed them on the internet uh, over SSH. Um, so they were kind of like honeypots, um, and then I recruited 10 pen testers and students and uh, amateur enthusiasts, and I asked them to SSH into these virtual machines, um, whereupon they were given access, they had low privileges, um, and I asked them to try and get root, um, to try and steal data, cover their tracks, and just generally kind of poke around the file system, um, as if it was uh, like a CTF or something like that. So um, each person attacked each machine, so there were two virtual machines, and what I wanted to see was how um, possible would it be to try and link together the paired attacks. So uh, my keylogger was recording everything that these volunteers were doing on these systems. Um, so I defined behavioral domains, in this case there were three, there was navigation which was how the volunteers kind of uh, navigated around the file system, enumeration, so um, commands they were using to try and find out more about the machines that they were attacking, and then exploitation which covered things like um, privilege escalation attempts, uh, exfiltration attempts, um, downloading malware, that kind of thing. Um, and turn these into yes or no questions. So to give you a couple of examples, one would be, did an attacker try to use wget to download malware uh, from a remote site? Um, a more granular example, did the attacker use ls-lah as opposed to ls-al? So in some cases, getting quite granular looking at specific command switches um, that the attackers were using. Um, then calculated the uh, similarity coefficient this gives you a, a better example of the kind of granularity that I was looking at. Uh, this is for the um, exploitation behavioral domain. So you can see it's not just a case of did the attacker use sudo, it's um, were they using sudo in a particular context with a particular switch, were they trying to sudo as a particular user, that sort of thing. Um, and these are the jacquard uh, values, the similarity coefficient values. Now, uh, I said earlier that you could, if you're not interested in logistic regression or you don't want to use it, you could just stop here. Um, and this is a good example of that. So if you look at the column, uh, the mean average column, um, second from the uh, left, you'll see that the mean value for linked offenses is much, much higher than the unlinked value. Um, so you've got 0 0.75, uh, sorry, 0 0.76 to 1.6, for example, for navigation. Uh, for enumeration, 0 0.64 to 0 0.11. Um, so you could just stop there, depending on how much data you've got and how kind of in-depth you want to go into. If you want to carry on doing logistic regression and rock curves, that kind of thing, these are the uh, eventual rock curve results. And the column to focus on here is the AUC column. Um, remember, um, from when I showed you the graph of, uh, of rock curves that um, an AUC value of one means it's, it's kind of perfect predictive accuracy. So you can see with navigation, enumeration, and exploitation, it ranges from uh, 0.91 up to 0.99, um, which is very high. So some ways that this could be applied in the real world is you could run interactive honeypots and have some kind of keylogger running on them to build up profiles of attackers. Um, potentially you could also identify attackers who've trained together, um, who've done the same kind of qualifications, or who've had the same mentor or things like that, um, because they'll do things in a similar way. There are some caveats to using this technique as with forensic linguistics. Um, some offenders will be more distinctive than others. Um, some behaviors will be less consistent. Uh, crucially, uh, and particularly um, pertinent with regards to cybersecurity, is that an offender's MO is a learned behavior. Um, and attackers, offenders do develop over time, they learn new tricks and techniques, um, so their kind of strategies might change. Um, 
and crucially as well, it's been found in uh, case linkage analysis literature that offenders will change their behaviours in response to events. What that means in practice is that for crimes that involve a lot of offender victim interaction, so things like robbery, um, for example, um, offenders are generally less um, distinctive and consistent because they're sometimes acting in response to what the victim does. So if the victim fights back or runs away or something like that, as opposed to something like uh, burglary where typically the victim is not there. Um, so in terms of cyber offences, um, the kind of attacker strategy may change depending on what security mechanisms are on the host that they're attacking, uh, whether the blue team is aware of their presence, uh, that kind of thing. Some caveats for this experiment specifically, um, this is a very small sample of people, there's 10 volunteers, um, so it really needs to be kind of widened out um, with more data, ideally real world data as well, to, to see if this is um, viable in the real world. Um, it's only looking at one operating system and one scenario, in this case uh, Linux machines um, with low privileged SSH accounts, uh, sorry SSH access. Um, so it remains to be seen whether the same thing would apply to something like a DDoS attack, for example, whether you could get that level of granularity that you need. Um, these weren't real attackers. Um, firstly, that they were kind of pen testers or, or students, um, but also that they knew they didn't have to be that careful about hiding their tracks, for example, um, because they knew it was an experiment uh, for uh, a piece of academic research. Um, not all attackers will have the same motivation, so for instance, not all attackers will want or need to escalate to root um, to achieve what, whatever it is they're trying to achieve. And again, not 100% accurate as with uh, forensic linguistics. So there are some privacy uh, implications to this um, in the sense that people can be linked to separate hosts or separate identities based on the way that they type. Um, and potentially that's regardless of how good their OPSEC or their anonymizing measures are elsewhere. Um, so people could be linked to historical or future activity on a particular machine uh, using this technique. Countermeasures um, would be kind of similar to forensic linguistics in a way. Um, you could make a conscious decision to try, if you know that you always use particular switches for a particular command or that you have a particular strategy for doing something, um, you could switch that up. Um, it would be harder to automate than forensic linguistics. Um, you could maybe semi-automate it using scripts or something like that. You could randomize ordering of command switches. You could switch up the tools you use. So you could use wget instead of curl. Um, you could use vi instead of nano, uh, although I realize how controversial that statement might be. Um, so in terms of what you can do now with this information, um, you can give this a go. It, it sounds complicated if you haven't done statistics before. It's really not, um, not that bad. Um, so you could run like a CTF or something. Um, make sure the participants are aware of what it is you're doing, but you could log all their keystrokes and maybe just try and calculate the Jacquard scores and see if this actually works. Um, and then if it does work, you could try and scale it up. Um, so one of the things that we're looking at is um, whether this could be automated with something like R or Python. Um, other behavioral domains would also be of interest as well. So we didn't really look too much at evasion techniques or kind of anti-forensic steps, um, but that's something that, um, that could be done as well. Um, if you want more detail, there is a, a white paper available on this. Um, there's also a uh, longer talk on this subject, uh, which I gave at DEF CON last year. Um, that's on YouTube. Okay, I'll move on to the last one. Um, before I start, does anyone get this reference? Otherwise, we might be in for a torrid 20 minutes. <laughs> No? Okay, uh, this will be interesting. Okay, so this is cultural captures. Um, and this is um, a little bit more abstract and more of an idea than the previous two. So the previous two human side channels I talked about are very much kind of rooted in statistics. There's empirical evidence to show that they work. Um, they just haven't been applied that much to, to cyber offenses. This is something a bit more experimental. Uh, that needs a bit more research. But um, essentially it's looking at a, uh, a particular problem in social media, on social media. So if you have a given account on social media and you want to know is this account a human or a bot, uh, there are various things you can look for. There's been a lot of research on various kind of behaviors and features that can be used um, to try and work out if it's an automated account or if it's a human at the keyboard. Uh, and there are various paid and free services where you can submit the name of a Twitter account, for example, and it will give you a probability of how likely it is that that account is a bot or not. A much harder question is, is the person 
running this account, assuming I'm fairly sure it's a person, if they're claiming to be British, for example, are they actually British? And the context in which that's important would be things where you have hostile social media accounts attempting to influence conversations or consensus around a particular political issue. Um, so an election, a referendum, something like that. Uh, mentioning no uh, specific words, uh, beginning with B. Um, so we think uh, these people are probably human, but how do we prove they're actually authentic? Um, and this potentially is where cultural captures can come in. So cultural captures is a term I've come up with to describe a cultural artifact which hasn't really spread beyond its place, its region or country of origin. Um, in most cases, and the examples I'm going to show you, that's popular culture, but it can also be things like language, uh, cultural norms, food, music, that sort of thing. So we'll try an example. Um, I, I gave uh, this talk at Black Hat um, in August, and this is a British example, and there was one British person in the audience, so this didn't work at all. Um, but if you know who these two people are, put your hand up. Okay, and now if you're from the UK, keep, keep your hands up, and if you're from the UK, or you grew up in the UK, or you spent a significant amount of time in the UK, put your hand down. Okay, one, one, okay, one outlier. Okay, interesting. All right, um, if you're curious, uh, these two are uh, children's entertainers. They ran a, a, a children's TV show in the kind of 90s and 2000s, but they never really kind of spread beyond the UK. Um, so this wasn't, I don't think it was broadcast outside of the UK. Um, let's try another one. So if you know the answer to this question, put your hand up. Okay, and again, same thing. So if you're from the UK, grew up in the UK, significant amount of time in the UK, hand down. Okay, interesting. So um, the answer to this is that this is just our comedy duo. They're called Reeves and Mortimer. Um, but you notice with this one, I've kind of edited the image a little bit. Um, and the reason that I've done that in this example is that uh, if you reverse image search that image, you get the answer straight away. Google tells you what the answer is. If you mess with the image a little bit and, and manipulate it, then um, uh, you can't tell anymore from Google what the answer is. Okay, uh, do we have any Americans in the audience? One, okay. Do you know who this guy is? Okay, that works, 100% success rate. Um, <laughs> does anyone who's not American know who this guy is? This is an interesting one. Okay, so um, this guy is, uh, is from a meme, actually, which is why I was kind of curious whether this might have spread beyond America. Um, so this guy is Jake from State Farm. Does that ring any bells with anybody? Yeah, but again, like, in the, in the UK, we've got no idea what State Farm is, what it means, who Jake is. So you can kind of see where I'm going with this. So you can potentially use this as a kind of challenge if someone's claiming to be from a particular country um, to kind of work out if they actually are. Uh, this is a really interesting example. Um, so this one is from the film Inglorious Bastards, and you'll be familiar with this one, I think. If you, if you haven't seen the film, um, the context behind this is Michael Fassbender is uh, a British uh, army officer, and he's gone undercover as a Nazi officer, and he's in a bar in France. And uh, he's trying not to give himself away. He's just ordered uh, three glasses for whiskey. But um, what he's forgotten is that in Germany you order three glasses. Um, so he kind of gives himself away there. But again, something that, that someone kind of outside um, you know, of that culture, of that country, of that region uh, wouldn't necessarily get. So there are kind of other examples you could use for this as well. Food, uh, so Royale with cheese um, is the example there. But things like music and cultural norms, that kind of thing as well. Um, so I want to kind of run through a case study of, uh, of this being used in the wild. And this wasn't me that did this. This was someone else uh, using this technique to um, potentially identify a suspicious, hostile Twitter account. Um, so. I haven't kind of put the Twitter account name here, but when you search it on one of these services, it says that it, it's probably, you know, it's involved in some kind of troll activity, but it's probably not automated. It probably is a human behind it. This was the question that this person posed to this uh, account. Now, this account claims to be British. It claims to have lived in Britain for 50 years. It's posting some very, um, uh, very dedicated, committed pro-Brexit material and propaganda. And this is the question posed. Um, so uh, a UK specific example, uh, and just for 
for the sake of fun, let's try try again. So put your hand up if you know the answer. Okay, and keeping your hands up. If you're from the UK, significant amount of time in the UK, hands down. One person. You, you again. <laughs> okay. So um, this is a, it's actually a character or characters from a TV show that's uh, better forgotten, probably. Um, but uh, yeah, we'll, we'll leave that there. So these are the responses. So the account that's posted the challenge uh, is the uh, account in the top left with the, the kind of brown red um, profile picture. The account that they're targeting is the account with the blue uh, Chelsea flag. Um, and you can say, I apologize for the language that that account is using. Um, but what this uh, challenger has done is they've posted this picture and this is, uh, these are some examples of the conversation that's happened afterwards. And you can see that the, uh, the account that's got the Chelsea flag is consistently refusing to answer the question, to provide an answer. Um, and they're getting kind of pretty aggressive about it. Um, and what's really interesting is the one on the uh, bottom left um, where they say, I know who they both are, I'm just not going to tell you. And then kind of uses a lot of profanity, which suggests possibly that that account is one that maybe needs further investigation in terms of where it's actually being operated from. So you could use this as a kind of verification system for uh, possibly accounts that have been reported as false or hostile or something like that. Um, not just um, for like Brexit in the UK, but also for, for political elections, um, for any kind of uh, influencing operation that, that may or may not be going on. Um, okay, so there are some caveats to using that. So um, firstly, you're relying on very specific cultural knowledge. Um, some of that may be age dependent um, and it, it may become increasingly difficult to find examples that um, the kind of um, younger generations get um, as kind of globalization increases and, um, and people kind of, you know, connectivity across the world uh, increases. Users may genuinely not know the answer, um, even if they're, you know, for example, from the UK, um, just because they didn't watch a lot of TV um, or that kind of thing. Um, and in that case, it might be similar to genuine captures. Sometimes you just genuinely won't know the answer to one. Um, there's also the problem that you don't want those images to be searchable in line, as I mentioned earlier, so you have to do some kind of manipulation and stuff as well. So in terms of uh, what you can do with, the, with this now, um, as I mentioned, this is kind of very experimental stuff. Um, it's never been kind of tested in the wild to see how effective it might be at scale. Um, so it's something that needs some further research. Um, in terms of how resilient it would be, um, what, whether the use cases would actually, um, you know, merit using this this technique, um, and an interesting kind of side area of research potentially for this would be around uh, click farm workers and catfish accounts and that kind of thing. If they're kind of paid to um, pretend to be from a particular culture or a particular country, how much research they actually do and how much background information they're given or they learn about, um, about the country. Um, so that could be an interesting area for future research. So um, key takeaways. Um, so the human side channels we've talked about, forensic linguistics, um, behavioral signatures, um, potentially cultural captures as well often kind of underexplored in a, a cybersecurity context, um, a little bit unconventional and multidisciplinary, but sometimes they can offer cost-effective opportunities for both uh, attribution and investigation and defense as well, potentially. Um, they're often thought of as very specialist areas, so linguistics, statistics, that kind of thing. Um, but hopefully, as you've seen, the barrier to entry isn't necessarily that high. There are kind of tools and stuff that you can download and use now um, that are pretty user-friendly that you can kind of play with and experiment with um, and kind of see how, uh, how useful those techniques might be to you. There are some, um, uh, definitely a lot of areas for future research around human side channels, so expanding the proof of concepts and the techniques that I've shown you here, maybe looking at other possible um, human side channels as well. Um, further research into cultural captures in terms of uh, scope and viability. Um, 
it would be really interesting to hear if anybody uh, either has already or would use or is planning to use things like forensic linguistics or behavioural signatures in actual incident response work or threat intelligence work, um, and if so, what the results of that would be. Um, automating some of this stuff, particularly the case linkage analysis um, work as well. So uh, if you're interested in that, um, then get in touch. I'm more than happy to have a chat um, and potentially collaborate if you're interested in doing that. That's my email address and my Twitter as well. Um, or send me a DM or something um, and we can chat about it. Just to go back to the aims from the beginning of this talk, hopefully um, these have been met. So being aware of three human side channels, how they work, some practical takeaways for each one, implications for security and privacy, possible countermeasures, and some ideas for future research as well. So um, that's it from me. Uh, thank you very much again for listening. Um, again, any questions or anything, um, you can uh, contact me on those two. Um, or I will take some questions now. But um, yeah, thank you very much.